Good morning, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Mary Ann Howard, and today I'm going to be reading to you from the book Ik Yak U, A Gross American History by Lois Minerhui. This book helps us understand daily life in colonial times, and it wasn't always fancy balls and fun clothes. Sometimes daily life was downright disgusting, and today we're going to talk about that. Have you ever been to Mulford Farm on James Lane? Built in 1680, it's been left largely unchanged since 1750. And when I talk about some of the things going on in this book today, you can think about people who were living and farming in East Hampton during the 1700s acting the same way. So chapter one of the book deals with the awful smells. Now I want you to take a minute and think about what happens when you go to the bathroom and the process in your head and maybe some of the modern day conveniences that you use when you go to the bathroom. And if you'd like, you can type some of your answers about that in the chat box there. What are some things that you think about that you use today when you go to the bathroom? Maybe you think about a designated room inside your house with a door that you can lock and close, or you think about using toilet paper, or washing your hands, or maybe flushing a toilet, or plunging a toilet. In colonial times, people either went outside to go to the bathroom, or they used a chamber pot. They didn't have any of those modern day conveniences. What's a chamber pot? It's actually a bowl that's kept in your bedroom and used as a toilet at night. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. The awful smells. America stank in the 1600s and the 1700s and the 1800s. Look, lots of horses clomp down the street. They toss their head and look pretty at one end, but at the other end, they poop. Cows roam the streets and poop. Huge pigs run wild eating garbage, and that also stinks. The pigs poop. In New York City, real streets haven't been seen in years. There's too much poop. The same is true everywhere in cities, towns, and farms. And if the layers of poop weren't enough, dead dogs, cats, and rats pile up on the streets. The smell is so awful, no one bothers to pick up the poop, dead animal bodies, or trash from the streets. Such conditions are just a part of life and not the concern of city government. Sometimes human poop ends up on the streets too. People don't have indoor toilets, so they keep containers called chamber pots under their beds to use, especially at night. These stink in the morning and they need to be emptied. And sometimes the contents are tossed out the bedroom window onto the street below. Of course, a warning is called out first, but that doesn't always help. In 1801 in York, Pennsylvania, a couple was walking down the street to go to a wedding. The contents of a chamber pot landed all over the woman, ruining her silk dress, but at least she wasn't the bride. Okay, so now you head to the backyard and you think that that's gonna be a little bit better. But the yard is a real mess. Oyster shells, small bones, broken dishes, and glass litter the dirt. You walk carefully to the back of the yard and another smell hits you, rotten food. You see seriously smelly garbage, including large rotting animal bones piled up on the ground. Next, you arrived at an outdoor toilet. It's called the necessary, the privy, or the outhouse. It's a small wooden structure with a door, and even if the smell doesn't tell you what it is, the flies buzzing around it do. You put a cloth over your nose and you open the door. It's dark inside. You see a wood shelf with two round holes cut through it. Underneath it is a deep pit called a shaft, dug to hold the human waste that falls from above. No flushing toilet, no running water. Imagine doing your business here every day. It's hot, stinky, and buggy in the summer, and it's freezing cold and dark in the winter. There's no way to wash your hands afterwards unless you stop at the well and pump some water, but most people don't even make that effort. Ew! Other places to pee. Look, when men went to a party, they expected to be able to relieve themselves without going outside. So chamber pots sat in the corner of a small cupboard for the men to use. Farm families often didn't dig privies. Instead, they went behind nearby trees or bushes, as did farmers and plantation slaves. And what about people in town who needed to go? They had to do their business in an alley, and the alleys weren't always cleaned either. Rose. 
Okay, so now this excerpt also mentions throwing garbage out the door into the backyard and you having to see it and walk across it to get to the outhouse. So how do you handle the modern day chore of taking out the trash? I'll give you to think about that process in your head and some of the modern day conveniences you use. And if you'd like, you can type up some of your answers in the chat box there too. What are some things that you think about? Maybe you think about using garbage cans or garbage bags or recycling or perhaps going to the town dump or composting maybe. Did you know that today recycling accounts for about 32% of garbage disposal, burning garbage accounts for about 12%, and then burying garbage in landfills accounts for 55%. The town of East Hampton has what's called a sanitary landfill as well as a recycling plant located on Springs Fireplace Road. A sanitary landfill is a large hole in some cities that can be up to 500 feet deep that gets filled with layers of waste. Between each layer of added waste is a layer of ashes, dirt, and other filters to control rodents, insects, odors, or other health hazards. Here, trash is isolated from the surrounding environment. The purpose here is to bury the trash in such a way that it'll be isolated from the groundwater. It's not designed to break down the trash, just bury it. To dump household or commercial waste in the East Hampton landfill or to recycle, you need to either buy a permit or pay for one day of waste disposal. With this, the town tries to keep our streets sanitary in a controlled fashion. Okay, our next chapter is going to deal with creepy crawly bugs. Bugs have always been with us and they always will be, but in early America, they were much more of a problem than they are now. If you had to give up modern methods of pest control, you would surely suffer buzzing mosquitoes. It's been a long day and you're ready for a good night's sleep. You check into a tavern that offers beds for rent. Unfortunately, you find out you have to share a bed with a man and a woman you don't know. The tavern is filled with smelly people and tobacco smoke, so you step outside. Immediately, you're surrounded by hungry mosquitoes. You've never seen so many of them at once. You're just wearing a t-shirt and jeans and you're soon covered with bites. You rush back inside only to find mosquitoes there too. So what can you do about these pests? You can try putting live coals in dishes to keep them away or scorch or burn brown sugar in bowls to smoke them out of rooms. Stinky. Mosquitoes were a shock to newly arrived Europeans. There are no such insects on the other side of the Atlantic. One French priest told his countrymen back home, the greatest torture of all is the mosquitoes. I really believe that the plagues of Egypt were not more agonizing. This little animal has inspired more oaths, swear words, than have been uttered in all of the world until now. You wonder how people stand these attacks, especially since you know something that these people don't know. Mosquitoes spread disease. To the people you're watching, these bugs are just another bloodthirsty pest. Okay, so first I wanna ask you, how do we know about what this French priest said to his friends about the mosquitoes? There are people who do research and look into letters and journals which are being written at a particular time period and find out what people are talking about by reading what they wrote. This is an example of a primary resource, something that was produced by someone at a particular time period we're studying. A newspaper article, a photograph, a diary, an interview, they're all examples of primary resources. And I want you to keep this in mind as we move forward with our Facebook programs this spring, okay? So back to the biting mosquitoes. What are some ways that we deal with mosquitoes today? Maybe you think about chemical repellents or natural repellents. Nowadays we use um, DEET or OFF, but people also use citronella candles and insect traps. Citronella candles are made with wax and citronella oil, which is an essential oil obtained from the leaves and the stems of different species of lemongrass. Native Americans in the West um, use Western yarrow as a mosquito repellent by placing the leaves of the plant on hot coals to make a spudge. In New England, Native Americans use sweetgrass, a sacred plant, to repel mosquitoes. They wore braids of dried sweetgrass around their necks, adorned their homes with the plant, and used it as a smudge, uh, meaning they burned it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about Bed bugs. Oh, I see your answers there. Maria, bug spray, yep, like deeten off. And Francis, ew, ouch, yep, mosquitoes definitely are ouch and yuck. <laughs> um, 
Okay, creeping bed bugs. Still itching, you climb the narrow wooden stairs to your room. The couple in the bed is already asleep, fully clothed. You push your way in. In the dark, you see little red bugs all over the bed. But as soon as you lie down, they attack your body. They bite and bite and bite some more. Each bite injects saliva that can cause swelling. You go crazy with itching. The bugs don't have wings, so they crawl everywhere, all over you, the bed, the wallpaper, and the floor. A single female can lay about 500 eggs in her lifetime. Yuck, and then some. You get up and you feel your way to an upholstered chair across the room. There's no electricity, so nighttime is really dark. You settle into sleep, but wait, bed bugs love upholstered furniture too. In fact, in most early American homes, such chairs are only used for seating for old people. And those chairs always seem to be home to any number of horrible biting bugs. You spend the night itching from the mosquitoes and the bed bugs fidgeting and wishing for dawn. You wonder how people in the past ever got any sleep. Unlike mosquitoes, bed bugs didn't exist in America until the Europeans brought them across the Atlantic in their baggage. So some people are used to them, but that didn't mean that they were happy about it. In 1794, Albert Sanger of Keene, New Hampshire, took down his bed and carried the frame to the creek on his property. He pushed it entirely into the water and then soaked and scrubbed it. It didn't get the bugs out. In the early 1800s, Sarah Bryant of Cummington, Massachusetts, cooked her bed frame to rid it of bed bugs. This may have worked as bugs can be killed by high temperatures. When your visit here comes to an end, you're gonna be need, you're gonna need to be careful when you climb back in your time machine and come back to the present day. You don't wanna bring any of those nasty bed bugs with you. If you do, they'll hide in your clothes and wait for dark and then they creep out and start biting again. Beware, you might find bed bugs in the 21st century as well. They're showing up in hotels, motels, and homes. They hitch rides in suitcases and clothes and spread from place to place. And getting rid of them is very difficult without using strong poisons, which can be bad for the environment. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about biting lice. Think about maybe in a time in your life that you've been tested for lice. When I was younger, about once or twice a year, the school nurse would go to each class with a comb and check our heads for lice. If we or if a friend was found to have them, we would have to wash our hair out with a special medicated shampoo to kill them. But back in colonial times, they didn't have that, right? In early America, lice were everywhere. Like bed bugs, lice are small and wingless and they bite and suck blood. They have specially developed claws that allow them to cling firmly to the hair where they lay their eggs. If you look carefully, you can see them in people's hair as well as lying and waiting in bedding. Lice feed on blood several times a day. People infested with lice can feel them moving around their heads, and you notice people itching and scratching. The bug spit causes that reaction. Ick. In the early 1700s, some men and women wear wigs, and lice infest those too. If women do wear their own hair, they pile it high on their heads and may, and may add wig hair called extenders. At least once a week, they have to open the head of their own hair of their wigs to kill the lice within. They use a fine tooth comb to comb out the bugs in their eggs, and then they treat the hair with acid, and that causes the scalp to burn, bringing tears to their eyes. Ouch! Some men shave their hair and tuck their wig over a bald head. This makes the lice easier to find, but it also makes the scalp more accessible to the bug spikes. Often you can see white lice crawling out from under a wig, ignored by the wig's wearer. Gross. People treat lice by soaking bed linens in poisons. The poison left on the sheets will kill the lice, but it can also seep into the skin of whoever sleeps on them. Yuck. Okay, so now the next page deals with bugs on the inside. So let's talk about tapeworms for a minute. Have you ever had your pet, maybe a dog or a cat, tested for tapeworms? A tapeworm is an intestinal infection of a parasite, which is an organism that lives off of another organism. Dogs get them through a bite from an intermediary like a flea, but humans get tapeworms from contact with feces or contaminated water, or by eating raw or undercooked meat. 
And as we've seen, the colonial times weren't that sanitary, and so it was easy for humans to get infected. Okay, so bugs on the inside. Not every bug can be seen with the eye. Some archaeologists look to the ground for information about the past. They often find the shafts that once sat below the privies. We talked about those. To study the people who use the privies, the archaeologists collect the rich soil inside and send it for testing. And this can reveal the eggs of bugs such as tapeworms or hookworms. These bugs lived inside people in early America and they passed through people's bodies into the privy shaft. People didn't know about the bugs inside their bodies and so they suffered from fever, diarrhea, or even death as a result. These hidden bugs made people sick for thousands of years before effective treatments such as antibiotics were discovered. So that's it for this book for now. If you're interested in it or others like it, please email us at programs at easthamptonhistory.org and we can let you know where you can find your own copy. And stay tuned for more information about these and other upcoming programs on our Facebook and Instagram pages. We're asking you to send us your journal entries or your photographs around East Hampton at this time so we can preserve the history that we're making today for future historians. We're taking next weekend off. I will be right back here on Sunday, April 19th at 9.30 a.m. I'll be reading aloud and showing you watercolors from Klaus Hoey's book, The Log of the Whaler, Helena. And then on Sunday, April 26th at 9.30 a.m., I'll be reading aloud from Ikyak U, Our Gross American History by Lois Minner Hui, the next two chapters. And both programs will be streamed live on our Facebook page. Thanks again for tuning in, and I'll see you soon, East Hampton.